Welcome back to another episode of Collector's Quest. I'm Tyler here with Johnny. Johnny, what's going on? You know, Tyler, I, I want to just say that I bet people are very relieved to hear you do the intro after I did the intro last week. <laughs> Does people like think like, oh no, Tyler's gone from the show. I mean, you've been doing all these after darks without me, and it is it's kind of like I'm gone from the show, Johnny. It, it sometimes it is like you weren't on the show. It's it's like you do so much other work. I was like, I gotta like pull my weight a little bit. Jesus Christ, should do something for the people. Um, no, I I just think that people are relieved that after giving them a sports episode where I did the intro, they're like, oh, thank God, it's not a sports episode. They're just like every time they hear me do an intro now, they're gonna be a little gun shy. I am, uh... even though that episode is your fault. I'm surprised by the reaction to the episode. So you said numbers wise in terms of like first week or two, or I guess it's been out for a week. So first week, like not a good episode numbers wise, but we have got a bunch of people who came to us and said like, yeah, fuck yeah, sports episode. Like they liked it. And then we got more corrections than usual. Uh, yes, I mean, we, we don't did. get a lot sure of corrections because um, we get everything right, Johnny. But we did get uh, some, uh, sure. uh, what are some fun things we got that people pointed out? Well, so this isn't necessarily wrong, um, but there is a Jordan cover before the Jordan cover we mentioned, and it's for an unauthorized, well, it's not unauthorized, it's an unauthorized use of Jordan's image on Basket Masters, thanks Josh Byerly, uh, for showing that to me, which is a European basketball game uh, based off Fernando Martin's basketball, who was the first Spaniard to ever play in the NBA. And they just like, they start changing covers around and there's just clearly a picture of Jordan on the back of one of them. There's also a picture of uh, an image of like Lake Lakers versus Pistons, uh classic 80s battle that's on one of the boxes. So they just, they were like, who cares about licensing? Let's put these basketball players on there without their permission. So yeah, this is, this is a computer game, up. a European computer game, to be clear. Yeah. Basket Master, I think, not Basket Masters, but... Uh... Either way, Matt. we we said it was the first Jordan game. This wasn't a correction, but this is more of a Josh Barley is a really cool guy who knows about all the weird obscure things that you haven't been buying for twenty years. Yeah, he, well, he also told us that there's um, Olympic decathlon. Also, was like the first game that kind of repped an athlete, even though it wasn't titled Pele. I think is still correct in the first authorized, you know, athlete image on the box. Like, you know, with their authorization and name. Um, but I guess Olympic Decathlon had, they ran an ad campaign and I, I can't remember who he told me was on it because it wasn't like a big name that you would super remember unless maybe you were older than me. Like the, the so. TRS-80 game? I believe so, yeah. That is, that's one of the first Microsoft games and one of the first boxed games ever. And yeah, I believe, well, does it have Caitlyn Jenner? in it, it as bruce it Jenner? might i'm reading that straight off the wikipedia article doing amazing live research off the most accurate yeah. source all right cool but but that's not who the ad campaign was based around it was based around someone else oh okay i mean if you're talking about like decath decathletes i don't know who they are johnny i me either i think that decathlon used to be more popular I mean, it used to be like the ultimate sport. Like if you could do, th if you were the winner of the decathlon, you were like hot shit. The fact that we can think of, so there's Olympic decathlon, there's the Activision decathlon, and there's like track and field, which has, uh, it probably has 10 events. I don't know what it has actually, but like there's all of those in the eighties. And like, when was the last time anyone cared about a decathlon game? So I yeah, maybe it was real no popular idea. in the eighties. Yeah. Don't know. But uh, that's not so much as a correction as just like, and also there that was this other thing that that's kind of in there all right um also we so that was that was like a an additional piece of information we were totally wrong about lebron we have heard the people do not buy nba 2k 14 whatever we hold said hold on well hold on well don't buy that unless you want lebron in his first heat jersey no one can these first they're jerseys, gonna you care. brought up these first jerseys like anyone cares about Bullshit. first jerseys they, they they definitely are going to care one day they care about it in sports cards they're going to care about it one day why are we doing more sports episode just put the corrections out god damn it where the whole audience is gone They've no left. i used to have to edit that at the end of episodes i'm like i'm so done with editing 
just in general, like all the extra work that goes in editing, I I already do enough editing. I'm not putting corrections at the end of every episode. So uh, also, we only got to. these corrections after everyone like listened to the episode. Anyway, yeah, yeah what is it? It's like a it's like a PSP game. The, the actual first LeBron cover. Yeah, it, it's um. Oh God, what is it? It's NBA Street Showdown, um, from I want to say 2005 on the PSP. And it's an awful cover. It, it's awful. It's bad. And it's PSP. Yeah. But I'm going to say this one definitely counts. And like, if you're if you're going to get the real thing, this is the real thing. There's also some PAL PS2 game that has like six headshots of, of basketball players in like boxes. And that cover is so garbage that that one, I'm going to say, doesn't count. Even though it's not the first the PSP game is. But whatever that PS2 game is. Is garbage. Do you know what the PS2 yeah. game is? Do you have it in front of you? Uh, I think it's NBA. Uh, man, it's the show. Is it NBA the show? I have no idea. All right, NBA the show 09 or something. Any other uh, any other hot corrections, Johnny? No, it, but just so we're clear, the PSP game counts. Like, go go get the PSP one. It is 2005. Okay. I'd say the thing we got the most response to was the like first cover appearance thing, as opposed to all the other things like what we're talking about, like rare games and like interesting uncommon games. Like maybe it's just that collectors have like been into that stuff for so long. And it's like, how much more is there to say about international superstar soccer? But uh, yeah, I mean, people, I I think people are some small core segment of people, as we could tell by the numbers listening to the show, are interested in like the first cover athlete stuff. The numbers aren't like completely down. They weren't like rock bottom. Right? It's not. It like wasn't our like the Star Wars anything. episode. No, it wasn't anything like that. It wasn't like the wrestling episode. For God's sake, it was uh, just just like a little. And that could just be also summertime that people were gone or something. I don't. Could be any number of things. So we'll we'll see. It, it's at that point it had been less than a week. But uh, part of the responses we got, which I thought were interesting, was people asking for a part two. And you're right. A lot of people who messaged me privately wanted more episodes based on like athletes on the cover of boxes. They like wanted to know and people make lists and collect around that. So that was interesting because I was like, man, there's a whole host of games where they're like, I would like to go through, maybe just do a rapid fire with you one of these days and just be like, does this matter? Who cares? Do you even know who this athlete is Um, for all all the games like in the 80s and stuff that had you know, just on the Nintendo alone, like how many games had athletes on the cover or coaches? A lot. There's a lot of named people, uh, a lot of named sports games out there. This is my favorite research to do. And I'm not I'm not going to do it for athletes because it's just not something I'm personally interested in. But when you think of like first cover appearances of athletes or, or anyone in general, when you're thinking of like something that you have to look at art to identify, in most cases, it's not something someone will have done the research for you. And you're going to have to just go through like a shitload of games on Moby Games to try to find the answer. And like when I'm when I'm going through like trying to piece together timelines of genres, like I could start at like Wikipedia and that's a great starting point. It's usually not like the end all be all. If I'm looking for something, uh, what's something very similar? Uh, I was looking for the first female protagonist in a video game. And like there's an answer and all the answers are kind of wrong. They're kind of not wrong, kind of wrong. Um, and it's just like really fun to basically go through every game ever looking for the first female protagonists. Yeah. You're just treasure hunting. You're yeah. treasure hunting through games. It's awesome. And then when you find it, it'll be like, Oh, I'm the only one who knows that Bill Russell was on this European cover. He's in the background, but I could see it's his Jersey and his number. This is an unauthorized piece of art of Bill Russell. This is going to be worth thousands of dollars one day. Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> so another interesting thing that happened is because we, the way we framed that episode, we kind of did like two different things in that. And there were people who messaged me who were also still hungry for more, more rare sports games. They're just like, talk about the rare stuff, the good stuff, that ex- those expensive games. They didn't care about the athlete angle. They just wanted to know, Talk about all the rare soccer games you could. And then I did have a co- like a cadre of people who were like, you didn't talk about these 15 sports. And yes, I, I know, like we didn't even like look at baseball and we said why. Um, but there's like a lot. I mean, there, the truth is there's a lot of sports games, Tyler. I mean, there's we could so have done many. an entire soccer episode, an entire boxing episode and yes. still gone over like all the same categories. Yeah, there's a lot of sports. There's a lot of sports games. And I think people don't really think about it because like. 
sports games are definitely like maybe you play the one you like, but you're not thinking about the rest of them. But they're making sports games for all the people. And so that just makes a lot of sports games. We didn't even bring up like extreme sports as a genre, which is something that like I think collectors do like they don't dismiss at least like I think a lot of people would take like a Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, a 1080 snowboard. Oh, yeah. Like they're totally fine with those. Yeah. I mean, we like uh, just mentioned that like we didn't talk about Tony Hawk. We could have talked Tony Hawk and the Tony Hawk games are very important. And that's the most important game probably to the skating genre. What Like what was anyone doing before that skate or die? Like, which was fine, and I All enjoyed right. it, but... Johnny, this is this is sports part two. We're talking about the historical no, games. Tony no, Hawk's no, no. Pro Skater. Like, most important game we didn't talk about. What are we doing talking about John Madden football and the Apple II? Who cares? Computer games, floppy disks, DRM code wheels. Like, what is that? I'm not a grandpa. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. Still a fun video game. Well, and that, there's so many games in the series, but also... Like, Tony Hawk was making money skating, obviously, but, like, his first big payout was because of the Tony Hawk games, which is also interesting to think about. Anyways, we've now done 20 minutes or whatever on sports. Uh, guys, Johnny, don't leave you know us. what's interesting, actually? Speaking of sports and entertainment, there are there's a series of, like, WWE 2K14 to 2K19 uh, were all developed in Japan, as was a unique Star Wars game for the Famicom. Johnny, there are some so that, some of these Japanese games, the, the Western things, but Japan. You're, you're really struggling I, here. Man, but let me I, help you. I had like the idea for a transition, but I, as I, I was got, saying the sentences, it didn't come out. <laughs> let, let me help you. So there's these very American or North North American games, right? Or or entertainment pieces that are developed in Japan, but somehow never make it to the U S even though they're based on like the most American thing ever. Yeah. Is that what you're going with? Yeah. As, oh, okay. as American as Mickey mouse, Johnny, because a lot of them are Disney games and I don't even think we're talking about that many, but there are a lot of Disney games that didn't come out in America. We aren't talking about any, I think we talked about a few in the Disney episode and like there's We'll probably get to a part two of that Disney episode one day, so you can count on some of those. Uh, yeah, there are a lot of big properties that just never left Japan that are very American, and that's what we're going to talk about today. These very, very Western ideas that somehow just like got locked in Japan, or in some cases Europe, and never made it here. Which is weird, because you'd think if we... If we are the, the biggest fans of that thing, right? If we are the originators and creators of that as an idea, like, wouldn't it be here? It, like, as a converse, like, could you imagine if there was this super big Gundam game that only came to America and not Japan? That would be strange, right? There's got to be some, like, Japanese anime that is bigger in America than it is in Japan, though. And I don't know uh, what I'm it sure. is, but there's got to be something. But these are big properties. It's not like an obscure one that like maybe Japan didn't latch onto. Like these are big American properties. They are big, big touchstone items that for some reason just didn't make it here. They developers or maybe logistically they just couldn't get it to America. And we're gonna we're gonna talk about those in today's episode. We don't have a ton. Uh, there there's a big list, and we could definitely do more of these. And uh, we're not going too deep. So like slow your roll if you're expecting a comprehensive episode. We just want to talk about them and bring your attention to them and see what you guys think about them yeah are you uh you ready to begin i'm ready to begin oh my god look at us we're doing it tyler we're doing it all right johnny uh, we're starting off with the entire wizardry franchise because as you know wizardry developed oh, by surtex oh, oh, software right. is one of the premier western developed rpgs one of the most important games of all time but then there's of course the wizardry empire games which are on like game boy color and pc tyler? and playstation and the wizardry gaiden games and there's like dozens of these wizardry spinoff games not to mention like the gotcha mobile games and then there's what's called the wizardry renaissance which is like another dozen games where they're trying to revive the wizardry franchise and like none of this came out in america Okay. Hey, Tyler. What's up? Remember when I was talking like big properties, cultural touchstones? <laughs> uh, how does it, it doesn't get much bigger than wizardry, Johnny? All the lines come back to wizardry, as we did once say on Collective I'm just, Quest. Look, talking very fast 
just like isn't it doesn't just make it make the cut you're like it doesn't matter how fast you talk tyler this <laughs> what if you don't interrupt me then we can talk about <laughs> the wizardry guiding game all right keep going keep going tell me more this is a sampling like, go tyler tell us <laughs> i don't know what the hell about ha- the- so there there are genuinely very many wizardry games that never came out in the west they're like most of them are first person dungeon crawlers. Some of them are like other kinds of spin-off games. And I like I looked through all of them trying to find something interesting to say about them, something that they evolved on the formula. Because like Wizardry is a very difficult, frustrating, and somewhat boring and repetitive game. Um and when I think of Wizardry, I'm usually thinking of like oh, like not not just that it's hard. There's a lot of things that just kill you and like the mazes are big and there's a lot of mapping and all that. Beyond just that, managing a party of like six people, it's just too fucking much to manage. It's a lot. And I was like hoping like, man, maybe on like the Game Boy Color version, they like streamlined some of this or like made this more fun somehow. And it doesn't just look like a bunch of boring menus. No, all the wizardry games are exactly the same. And they all look really boring until you get to like the PS2 era. Maybe they made some improvements there because the graphics look a lot better. But uh, no, wizardry, we're not talking about wizardry except for that we are talking about wizardry right now uh, because I've got nothing exciting to say about the Japanese wizardry games, John. Okay. I so desperately wanted to though. There are two Game Boy Color games, two Game Boy Color That's kind of, wizardry RPGs crazy. that never came out in America. How cool would it be to have Game Boy Colored first person dungeon crawlers, Johnny? I mean, maybe I there would, are ones, but how cool would, would it be to have it. two more? You love Game Boy Color. I would buy it. I would buy it. I'm not even kidding. I would buy that. All right. Well, John, do you want to talk about like maybe a, a real game that we actually looked into and think is collectible? Um, no, I think we should continue on wizardry. <laughs> yeah. Great. You, uh, okay. Yeah, let's Tell talk about, about wizardry, wizardry 8 for the PC in 2001. The the last real wizardry game, I think, is is what no. Most okay, people... I, I'm just well, okay. Oh. <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna couch this a little bit. I, I think you're. I'm gonna go, but I think yours is probably a better example. Labyrinth. You guys know Labyrinth. David Bowie, you remind me of the babe, the whole thing. Labyrinth. Jim Henson. The, you, you familiar with this? I know you're not a child Got of the Crystal Ball. Yeah. I am. He, 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 got... he, he does contact juggling. He, he Jareth, does the contact Goblin King. juggling. Yes. With a fashigi. Okay. Is that what that's called? There was a, a brand of like clear ball for contact juggling oh, called Fashigi. Yeah, they, that had that was like as seen on TV. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember that now. That that's like an early aughts thing. Wow, nice call. Um, anyways, so Labyrinth. Um, <laughs> this game, man, it it is. It's called Maze of the Goblin King. Labyrinth Mayo no uh, Mikiu, and I'm gonna get that completely wrong. Anyways, it was developed by Atlas, and we all love that. And it was built in association with Henson Henson Associates in Inc. Uh, which, you know, is Jim Henson. This game is made to kind of look... People want to say Zelda. I don't think it looks like Zelda. It's an isometric game, so people like Zelda. It actually has graphics more like the original Dragonware. It's kind of an ugly game. Um, It was on the original Famicom... I was just going to say original Nintendo. It's on the Famicom and did not make it here, but it was also on the MSX. And if you have not seen the MSX box art, it is horrific. It It is... It says Labyrinth in like the font that you would see on the movie poster. And then there is this horrible like dot matrix 8-bit print of David Bowie. But if David Bowie, uh, I don't know, had been strangled or something, I, it's just horrible. It, it, I, it, it's his face looks a little deformed and too wide and like his sharp features are kind of lost. It, everything is just really soft in the in the image of him it's real ugly anyways go look it up go labyrinth msx2 um horrible horrible looking game anyways but that's these were only in japan and you would think something like labyrinth which is as big as it was like they're just re- there's a kickstarter for labyrinth right now uh boom studios is re uh re-releasing um a novelization of the original uh labyrinth so there was a book that came out when the movie came out and this was typical back in the age, like Scholastic would re- release a book to go with the movie. So you could basically read what happens in the movie. And if your parents hated you and made you read books instead of let you watch movies, I, I guess that's who these were for. I don't know. Uh, my parents didn't love me. So we didn't buy things like that. Just kidding. I did get a few of these books. Anyways, this 
book, though, was written before the script was finished. I don't know if you know anything about the shooting of Labyrinth or anything, but they revised Labyrinth. And, like, that was a hard movie for them to get together and get right. So they were changing stuff up to, like, nearly the end of shooting on it as far as the script and the story. So the book has things in it that aren't in in the movie. And uh, so so does the game. It has a couple of those moments. But anyways, there's now a, a, a Kickstarter for a new graphic novel based on that book. So Boom Studios has also released an origin tale of Jareth. Uh, there's been Labyrinth uh, manga that's out there. There's a lot of Labyrinth stuff out there. I'm not surprised that this game is very, that like the property is very popular in Japan. It, it has some Japanese sensibilities, I'll say. Um, so I, I can just see that. David Bowie cult- seems like a guy who would be big in Japan. I don't know. Yeah. Like, I just like the way he dresses and everything is like, uh, he, he is almost an anime character unto right? himself. Yeah. Right? So <laughs> he's got a lightning uh, bolt across his face. Yeah, I mean, it, it just and everything he does, like you could see how that would translate. And Labyrinth is like a weird fantasy, uh, also like creepy older man and a young girl. I don't like uh, very those... Japanese, Johnny. I'm not going to go there and say <laughs> that, but there are a lot of stories that happen like that that tend to be more popular there, uh, or maybe they're just more frowned upon here. I don't know. I'm not into that. Um, anyways, uh, yeah, this is. This is just uh, it. I can see how that happened. There's also a labyrinth for the PC um, that was done by Lucas Arts that we've talked about before, but that was released in America, and that is completely different than these two games, which are similar. Um, the isometric view on it is just, I yeah. I guess it will play a little like Zelda. You play as Sarah and you walk around, and you throw rocks and stuff, but it it's ugly. It's an ugly game, and I know it's the an Lucas Arts game. one you're talking about now. No, the LucasArts one is also horrifically ugly, but in a different way. Um, I'm talking, this is like, sometimes, you know, like old sprite games are just like, oh, look at, look at how good the sprites are. This is like if, if Dragon Warrior and Fester's Quest had a baby. I, I don't like it. I don't like the look. That's just me. This is aesthetics. Wh- who gives a shit about aesthetics? Anyways, you can find this game for not very expensive. The uh, Japanese box art for the Famicom game. There's no art. It's just literally labyrinth. And then, uh, you know, more text. The, the whole box is text with uh, some, uh, you know, when the stars like fade away in in space. Uh, it's got that on it. Um, kind of. That's what they're going for. Uh, really kind of boring. It, it looks like the top half of a comic. And then the art should be below it. Sure. There's just nothing. I mean, but if you are an American looking through Famicom games and you're like not familiar with the Famicom library, when you look through a lot, it'll be like, don't know what that is. Don't know what that is. Oh, Labyrinth. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, it, I recognize one of these 20 games. Yeah, it, it is. It is. Rec- the font is there and it is big. I'm talking the font is literally edge to edge on this game. You cannot miss it, even on these small carts. Um the response to this game is like medium. Uh, like people said, it's okay. You know, it's not very expensive. Uh, I just literally picked one up and I, it's surprising. I didn't have one before this actually, but yeah, uh, I enjoy, I enjoyed buying it. It's like, you can get one for 20 ish bucks to $50. If you want to buy a nice one, uh, go to Zen market though, or like Yahoo auctions, Japan, if you can in the U S you're going to, if you try and go get it through eBay, you're, you're always going to pay a little more and that'll just be a caveat for the rest of the episode. So we don't have to keep saying it. All right, Johnny. Uh, I like that you didn't give a price for the computer ones. Cause you just know, no one's going to buy an MSX game. Let's, let's be real. No, uh, I mean, <laughs> I would buy the MSX one. Like the art is so horrible and bad that you should buy it. But I, I didn't look up the MSX one. Cause I figured we're really talking like this is an easy buy. Like it's an easy buy. If you like, it's like 25 bucks. It doesn't hurt that bad. All right. Johnny, I realized why I should have started because we're starting uh, the earliest game that that we found. I'm sure there's an earlier game, but uh, yeah, this is not chronological order. But this is not chronological order. But the earliest Western property, maybe that didn't come to America, Popeye no Igo Asobi. Popeye teaches English or Popeye English fun. I don't remember exactly what it means. Uh, it is the Donkey Kong Junior math for English. Um. Neither Donkey Kong Jr. Math or Papa English are quite as rare as Donkey Kong Jr. Math is in America. So, like, these are still, like, kind of uncommon Japanese games, but 
Uh, they're more gettable in Japan. So if, if you have that, that hole in your set and you need a Donkey Kong Jr. math and you don't want to pay $7,000 for one, uh, you can you can go get a Japanese one. But we're talking about Popeye English, which is, it, it looks like Popeye. If you don't know the arcade game, go play Popeye. It's it's a classic. It's a Shigeru Miyamoto game. Come on. Um, and this this is this is crazy because Donkey Kong Jr. math, it like, no, it doesn't make sense. It's so ridiculous as a concept, but at least Donkey Kong is a Nintendo character. To take a licensed character and to throw them into an educational game, it, it it's funnier to me that this exists. But Well, there, there's a whole big thing with Popeye. Like, did Miyamoto just love Popeye? Because this is not the first time he's tried to get, like, or maybe it is the first time, but there's, like, even in the arcade games, right? Nintendo was trying to push Popeye games on us. I think Miyamoto has said in interviews it's something along the lines of like if he wasn't trying to get Popeye licensed to make a Popeye game, he would never have become like some hotshot game developer, game designer. Like he wanted to make a Popeye game, I think is like what he wanted to do. Otherwise, he would have just been like an artist or something. And that's interesting. So so we have this success of, of video games and uh, some of the greatest games ever to blame partially in response to Popeye. Kind of like the entire, like in a sense, like because he designed like Super Mario Brothers and Legend of Zelda, kind of like the entire history of video games has been shaped by the existence of Popeye as a franchise. <laughs> Which is Which hilarious so to crazy. think about. Like everything. <laughs> if Popeye didn't exist, like everything would be different. Which is so Some real butterfly effect shit right there. Yeah. <laughs> Just fucking man, Popeye. This Popeye English game, it is part of the small box series of, uh, of Famicom games, which are the earliest Famicom games that launched with the console. And so there is a distinction here. There's the small box set, which is a form factor of box, which are the earliest Famicom games. And there's the pulse line set and the pulse line games all come in small boxes. But there are additional small box games that come with picture label cartridges. Uh, so just know that small box and picture or small box and pulse line are not 100% interchangeable. Also, there are small box first party Nintendo games, which is analogous to the black box set in America. And there's something like 16 of them. But then uh, the very earliest third party games from Taito, Namcot and uh, uh, Hudson also came in the same form factor. So you can kind of expand upon the set. So it's kind of like getting the black box set. And then if you also want the early NES stuff, you get your games like Ninja Kid and Muscle. And they kind of have that same early NES energy, I feel like. But um, because no one actually cares about Popeye English, the one interesting thing to know about this game, which I've mentioned before, it comes with an insert that has a bunch of English words on it. I don't remember how the insert relates to the game. Just make sure you have that, like this little dictionary insert. Just make sure you get that with the game. Uh, but... More interesting to probably people new to collecting Famicom games, Johnny. The small box set, the first party small box games are Hogan's Alley, Duck Hunt, Wild Gunman, Tennis, Mahjong, Go, Pinball, Golf, Donkey Kong, Donkey Kong Jr., Donkey Kong 3, Donkey Kong Jr. Math, Mario Bros., Popeye, Popeye No Igo Asobi, like real outlier in terms of games that you've heard of or care about, and Baseball. Woo. If I was to pick what are the the coolest ones to get and maybe the, the ones that are going to really demand a premium for nice condition, probably Donkey Kong and Mario Bros. Which, I mean, saying that, it seems like, obviously, Tyler, we're living in 2023. But yeah, sometimes like you, you're going to have to pay up for nice Donkey Kong and Mario Bros. Probably Donkey Kong Jr. as well, because that has a white box. How much does it cost? It's like 50 to $200. It's really condition dependent and whether it has that dictionary insert. Should you get I mean, it? I don't know. I would say baby, basically don't get this unless you're getting all the small box games, but it is one of the more interesting small box games. Who doesn't want to own the game that basically is responsible like for shaping shaping video game history? Well, that, that would be like the real Popeye. Oh. Like, go get a Popeye arcade cabinet. Like... <laughs> Like, so that's weird. So Donkey Kong came out before Popeye, right? Because, yeah, because he wanted to make Popeye, but then it ended up being a project later on. I, I don't remember the exact story. So is, like, the Popeye arcade game, like, is that as collectible as Donkey Kong now? Because really, Miyamoto's desire to work on Popeye is what shaped video game history. Donkey Kong just happened, but but Popeye is what he loved. Okay, I got one more thing to say about Popeye English. 
Wikipedia lists Shigeru Miyamoto as a producer. Uh oh. I can't find anything to corroborate that. I mean, it's probably true. I don't know why it's there. But like you look at all these lists, there's there's so many of these like tables online of Shigeru Miyamoto games, and it'll be like it'll have like different columns of like director, producer, executive producer for like the different things that he's worked on. And like basically the games that he's a director on are kind of like the games that he designed and made. And the games that he's a producer on are like, okay, I guess he did something with Pikmin 4, but I don't know how much Shigeru Miyamoto was actually working on Pikmin 4, uh, you know, compared to all the other designers and programmers that actually go into making a modern game. Like, games aren't made by one person anymore is kind of where I'm going. But then I found, I, I wanted to corroborate this so badly, uh, but I found, the best source I found was an interview on Nintendo.co.jp in Japanese, and... He said that he wasn't involved in porting Mario, Donkey Kong, or Popeye from the arcade to the Famicom because he wanted to work on baseball, tennis, and golf. And he said nothing about Popeye English, so it's probably like this weird kind of side stupid game in Japan as well. But he didn't mention it, so I don't know. I mean, it sounds like this wasn't his baby at the very least because he didn't even mention it in terms of games he was working on and if he was a quote-unquote producer it's probably just because oh popeye's involved here and i'm the one who made the popeye arcade game so let me oversee something about how you're turning this into an english educational game so is this a shigeru miyamoto game i would basically say no but uh sure go ahead and collect it for your shigeru miyamoto set because it's a popeye game okay uh, man, it's and there's other Popeye games too that went to Japan and didn't come here. This is not the only one. I mean, even the Game Boy Popeye, we we have the same thing with Goonies as we do with Popeye. If you buy Goonies uh, in North America, you get Goonies too. In Japan, there's a regular Goonies. We could talk about that. I, I don't think we're gonna. But same with on the Game Boy. There's a Popeye two on on North American Game Boy, but the Popeye one, like just called Popeye is in Japan. It's weird. Go get them. They're properties you know. And as you know, this is always a, a really good strategy in video game uh, video games. You should just buy a video game based on a licensed property that you like, rather than the merits of the game itself, so, which is why you should go after things like Popeye on Game Boy. Huh? So, I don't know. Popeye on Game Boy could be a totally fine game. I don't know. but I have no not. idea. I'm sorry for slamming you, Popeye. Johnny, what do you got? What else? Uh, what else are we talking about? Well, I mean, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna flip down the list a little bit, and then I I don't have too much to say about this one. I just really think it's funny, and like I said, I, so I, and I wanted everything not to be Nintendo on the Mega Drive. So you know, Sega Genesis Mega Drive. This is there's a game. Maybe you've heard of it on the on the Genesis called Crossfire. You heard of it? Oh, that's the game where you have like two plastic guns pointed at each other and you yeah, shoot cross these metal fire. balls. Yeah, that's not that. Okay. Okay. Anyways, there's this game uh, called Crossfire. Did you know, though, that that game was not actually Crossfire? They had some licensing issues. So when it came to America, they changed it to this generic Crossfire. They did not really change the box art. They just changed the title. Pretty much everything is the same. Except that in Japan, this game is called Super Airwolf. Do you know what Airwolf is? Airwolf is a Sega arcade game, Johnny. Cool, 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 cool. Oh, you were uh, talking about, like, the <laughs> the property. The property. No, honestly, no. I only know of Airwolf as, like, the game series. So, no. <laughs> okay, so Airwolf is a helicopter. Okay, think A-Team, but in the sky with a helicopter. Okay, it's in this era of, like, 80s television where, like, mercenaries or some shit were, like, cool and tough and they had cool vehicles. And I, I don't remember if it was mercenaries for Airwolf. It may have just been uh, military or paramilitary or something. But it's a helicopter. It's an attack helicopter game. And... um Anyways, uh, uh, not game, but that's the show. There, Airwolf is a fucking helicopter, and I just think it's hilarious that in Japan, that this game is Super Airwolf, which is a sequel to Airwolf. That was an Airwolf game as well uh, that we got. Um, Airwolf is on the Nintendo, right? So 
Yeah. Probably not so a game you think of very often. Acclaim had the license for Airwolf games, so the Airwolf NES game prevented the release of the Super Airwolf Genesis game. There you because go. Because it wasn't published by Acclaim. Correct. So, Wild. Anyways, uh, this is not that expensive. It's like 50 or $60. Uh, you can go find it. So if you care about helicopter games, you can go buy Airwolf. It's just recent. Go look at the posters. It's wild because a lot of times they like change the art and like art gets changed for so many reasons. But this one is just literally like, oh, no, it's just all the exact same art. And it's very confusing. I'm like, Airwolf? And that was one I just ran across when I was looking at uh, when we were doing our Japanese shopping. I was like, what is that? That's not that's Crossfire. Why does it say Airwolf? And then I looked it up, and this is what we have. So if you care about a Genesis game, go go get uh, go get yourself some Airwolf. How much Mega Drive games are expensive, Johnny? How much is Super Airwolf? Oh, like, why should I buy this anyway? No, no but it's fifty to eighty dollars. I don't know. Oh, like, right. You should buy it because it's cooler that it's called Super Airwolf than Crossfire. Because when I say Crossfire, you think of exactly what everyone thinks of Crossfire. Like that's yeah, I mean, but that's also of. kind of cool. <laughs> I mean, just no, saying. because look, I'm just saying that sets an expectation for something cool that this game is not going to deliver on. All right, but Super uh, Airwolf clearly would. I mean, it just deliver changes the expectation. All right, all right. That, look, it's not like I've played it. I'm going to say this is a great game. I have not really played either game. Um, I just thought it was interesting. Like I said, I'm not talking too much about. It. I just thought it was interesting that it exists. Right. Um, Crossfire. It's like. So what's up with Crossfire on Genesis? You know, this is this is something that uh that Daddy Mole can g- and get back to me with. Um there's like this series of shooters on Genesis that has kind of like full art across the box. Like Gaiaris is another one, Musha is one, rather than like that standard red Genesis label or like the black grid Genesis label. There's like a bunch of these like shooters and they're all like a little bit more uncommon, a little bit more expensive. I think they're usually Japanese games. Like what's are these related? Because like I, Crossfire is just a game I look at and be like, oh, that's one of those full art games. That means like, right. oh, it's probably a cool Genesis game because it's got like that full cover art. Well, and it's a, it's a shmup and it has different conventions because it has you on the ground, but it also has you in the air as a helicopter. Like it has you on the ground, like a car warrior style and then up in the air. It, it It's different. So. All right. But I, I get the same. I get what you're saying with this because I sometimes have that same feeling like. Ah, this feels like it belongs in a group, but I there's no official grouping. It's not like so. Crossfire was published by Kyugo, and that was the only game they published ever, <laughs> or at least for yeah. Sega, according to Sega Retro. So it's not part of any kind of set. And before we go any further, we should say, and it's we're remiss not to have done this earlier. Big shout out to Daddy Mulk because we were compiling this list, and he's like, "Oh, I have already done a list kind of like this. Uh, let me send that to you." So. We got to poach off of his information. So thank you, Daddy Mulk, for all of your help. If you didn't hear, we did an episode in the After Dark where we talked about Genesis variants with Daddy Mulk. So if you haven't heard that, go check it out. Yep. Just another example of how all the best information in video game collecting is literally passed around in random Google spreadsheets around the Internet and it's not actually published anywhere. <laughs> right. And then that's not getting better anytime soon. Uh, it's been getting worse. Someone fix it. I don't know. This is a business opportunity. I will pay. I will pay so much for like really high quality collecting info. I don't know how many other people would, but like put out the catalog. Someone give them to me. Not this bullshit copied from Wikipedia stuff. Research. You research the real, the real deal variants and, and like lists of whatever collectors want to know about. I will pay anything for that stuff. And... There's dozens of us. Yeah, there. Think of how many people bought this this uh, the family bits book about Taiwanese Famicom games. There's dozens of us who bought it. I'm sure. There, there uh, are there is a group. Uh, you know, I, the problem is I think people need to work together to get it done. Um, I don't trust books written by one guy most of the time. Yes, one guy could go do it. I mean, there's a few people I talked to. I just talked to, we're just going to keep plugging after, but I just talked to Jason over at Game Rave, uh, where we talked PS1 variants for an After Dark episode. Like, if he wrote a book about what's what on PlayStation, I would buy that book and read it. But he's nice, so we just published that all on his website, and he owns all that stuff. So everything about you know, US PS1, he has it and he's confirmed it and it's on his website. If he knows about it, he publishes it. 
So uh, any confirms it with the actual physical goods down to ring variants. Guys, if you care about ring variants, which is the uh, equivalent to screw variants on NES cards, you know, go, be talking to Jason. Go to GameRave.com. That's game dash rave. Jason, I know you're listening to this. Literally just take all your information, just like GameRave.com and just like publish a book. Publish it. Like, I don't and care if it's just it. the same information on it. Like, we will buy it. Everyone yeah. knows you're the guy. You're like, you've been around forever. You're not like someone who's popped up in the last two years and is claiming to be a PlayStation expert. Like, you go way back with this garbage. And like, there's constantly people like us who point to you and they're like, yeah, he knows everything about PlayStation. Look at him. He's playing these skydiving and army men games in his YouTube channel because he just plays every PlayStation game. All he thinks about is the freaking PlayStation 1. Uh, just put out a book. Just we do it. I know it's going to be like so much work and you will never make enough profit for what you put into it, but I want you to do it anyway. We're asking you to do work. You know, as people, as guys who make a podcast who we do not profit enough for the work we put into it, I realize we have, we have super generous patrons and all that but like we're mostly doing this as as our hobby and as a labor of love not sure. mostly we are entirely doing that we literally started the patreon because we were paying money in hosting costs that we were never recouping that's the reason we started patreon yep and that was pretty much it i was like oh, i guess it would be nice and like we have to pay all the storage to keep everything uh it's getting it's not that it's expensive or we couldn't afford it but it's like uh, it would be nice if we could subsidize it a little bit Johnny, I've got the pick of the episode. I think this, this is like oh, unanimous. Nope. Two out of two Collector's Quest hosts are going to agree this is the pick of the episode. Is it? Hmm. Hmm. Uh, you Can tell me if you disagree. Picks? This is probably, I mean, have- if we still did post on Instagram, this would be the cover art. One of us would shell out $1,000 for this game. The Amazing Spider-Man Lethal Foes on the Super Famicom, Johnny. There are exactly two things you need to know about this game. One, Spider-Man. And two, it's probably the best Spider-Man cover art of any Spider-Man video game. And it, I don't think it's copy-pasted assets. I think this is unique cover art for this game. Um, it's so good. It's really good. And like, like Spider-Man kind of not known for having great cover art, I don't think. Like, Separation yeah, Anxiety is fine. Spider-Man has so- the N64 PS1 era one I, where he's climbing the building, that one's pretty good. Are we, are we talking about the games or comics in general? Uh, no, the games. I okay, mean, not the okay. comics. I mean, I'm the like, comics, I'm sure, have tons of great ones. I was going to say, like, McFarlane did so many covers. Are yeah. you going to fucking shit on McFarlane now? Like, what's happening? Oh, no, no I'm just yeah, talking about on. the video games. I think, like, oh, think okay. of, like, Spider-Man on Sega Genesis. It's like, okay. It's not exciting. It's, it's Spider-Man on a black background. Well, like. The LJN one is, like, okay, but it's, like, a weirdly super zoomed in face shot of yeah. Spider-Man's mask. Like, this looks 100% like a comic book cover. Yes, yeah. One, it it looks like a classic '90s, like the sweetest '90s art that you used to get. And you're like, man, look at this. And it like it's even got like the Marvel logo in the top left corner, like yeah. kind of trying to look like it's a comic book. It's crazy that a game that looks this good. It does not matter. This is the '90s. It does not matter how dog shit this game is. It's crazy that a game that looks this good in like presentation box sense didn't come out in America just to trick kids with this awesome cover art. <laughs> Um, I don't know who these people are, but the comic, the cover artists are Mark Bagley, Carl Kessel, and Paul Mounts. Three people listening to the show know who those people are. Uh, it is like the most generic looking action platformer Spider-Man game, really just action game. He just walks around and punches dudes. It's exactly what you would expect from a generic 16-bit Spider-Man game. Uh, it did not get a good review in Famitsu. It got a 21 out of 40. Uh, really the only weird thing is that this came out in Japan, but not America. And Johnny, you can go on Yahoo and get a cartridge for like, I don't know, 30 to 50 bucks or. Okay. Is that a thing you buy? Uh, you know, maybe, maybe don't buy a loose Super Famicom cartridge because like Super Famicom games are out there, Johnny. And this seems to come up maybe once a month, complete in box in various conditions, uh, for which you can pay maybe. $400 400 to $1,200 for it, and those 400 ones are, like, real trash. And even, like, the $1,000 one that we saw was sun-faded and had a rip on the back. Uh, I think the nicest one, there was, like, a $700 one that was pretty nice, and there was a $1,200 one that was pretty nice. Uh, that's a lot for a Super Famicom game that you've probably never heard of. And I really want this game. Uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, I mean, the prices are all over the place, I think, because it's just like 
how many if it's coming up like once a month or so like how many people are really looking to spend hundreds of dollars on amazing spider-man lethal foes so it's probably something if you set up a save search eventually the right copy will come up kind of deal but uh it does seem a little bit uncommon but the cartridges are cheap people just want that sweet box it's cool it's the pick of the episode johnny it's it the the box art is so cool it's so cool. It's got it's got right. some of those lethal foes, Johnny. It's got the Green Goblin. It does. It's got Doctor Octopus. It's got Venom. It's got Carnage. It's got that crocodile guy. I don't know. I don't know if he's in the pinball the lizard. game. Is that lizard. Mysterio or Mephisto? Something like that. Can you tell? I don't uh, read Spider Man. The, bu- the the green bubblehead guy is uh, Mysterio. We did the it. Crocodile looking guy is the lizard. It's the Sinister Six, but basically, okay. We did right. it. Johnny. We did. All right. I'm, I'm going to talk it. about it. <laughs> Go. Yeah. I'm going to. All right. Hey, I'm trying to. I'm going to talk to you guys uh, briefly about a game that uh, I enjoy uh, looking at and buying. Hey, it's Super Back to the Future, too. Hey, do you like Back to the Future, Tyler? Uh, Yeah. Sure. The first I one. think everyone likes Back to the Future. Does the it, ones are, okay. are there people. It's fine. Like the second and third one are fine, but the first one is like uh, like a perfect movie. Um, it's like great. I want you to do nothing to Back to the Future. I love Back to the Future. Second ones are fine, but uh, I I don't understand because like I don't know anyone with ill will towards Back to the Future as a franchise, you know, um, except for maybe Crispin Glover. Um, if you don't know the story about why Crispin Glover would have that, that's a that's a whole side story. Johnny, Anyways, what about the angry video game nerd? He really oh, hates man. those Back to the Future games on the Nintendo. So here, here's side note real quick, guys. <laughs> as, as we're doing this episode, I'm like, all right, we've got this list. I'm like, I think these ones would be cool to talk about. They're like big franchises, and I don't want to go too in the weeds on anything dumb. And Tower's like, angry video game nerd did that one. Angry video <laughs> game nerd did that one. Angry. I'm like, God damn it. That guy doesn't even like games. Uh, the whole bit is he doesn't like games and he doesn't, and I'm not just to be like an angry guy who doesn't like video games. He just doesn't like games. He wants to make movies. That The, the, the series, the company is called Cinema, was called Cinemasker, okay? Just think, just put it all together that that was a character and this was a, a vehicle to make money to make his movies. Guys, he doesn't care. Does not care about games. Anyways, uh, it was infuriating that like everything Tower's like, yep, he did it, he did it. And it's like, well, I You're can't talking just about, like live the in a Beavis world. and Butthead game, uh, like the yeah. point and click adventure and like the Ghostbusters game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, oh yeah, he talked. It's like, of course he did, because these are the big series. But whatever. Uh, you know what? Lots of people have done videos on a lot of this stuff. So whatever. I'm still talking about Super Back to the Future 2 because I think it's I think it's interesting because it's a beloved American franchise. Of course, I think it's loved everywhere. The game, uh, the game has like mixed reviews, right? Like a lot of people say it's about a seven out of 10. Um, the characters, some of them are a little super deformed. It's uh, some people say it has RPG elements. It's mostly like a side scrolling platformer. It's, it's fine. It's, it's interesting that it exists. Most people give it like an okay review. It is expensive. It is desirable though. So the secrets out, and this is, this is a game like you would just expect that it would have got released in America. Some of the theories on why it didn't is because it's coming out well after the hype of Back to the Future. So it's we're like five years post Back to the Future 2. Why are we going to publish this in like 1994 in America? It's like maybe we don't do that. Maybe we just leave it here. Other things is LGN having the rights to Back to the Future and complicating publishing Super Back to the Future 2. Nobody's going to uh, play this for, game without the Back to the Future license, whereas people will play Super Airwolf without the Airwolf license. You're right, right. Uh, well, you also, this game relies on the characters being the characters. You need Marty. You need Doc. You need Biff. If you don't have these characters in the game, then it's not Back to the Future if you change it, right? It, because it's, it, it has to be something else. So um, Marty, come in my flying silver Toyota Camry! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Barry, Barry, come with me as we go f- home to the future. Yeah, just not. <laughs> this is yeah. sounding kind of funny. Like I'm now, like now you're into it. I'm kind of into this. Okay, um, you know, there's a whole thing about how people 
don't like the title Back to the Future because it doesn't make sense. What, they like, that's they like just, a, that's there's the a whole point. cadre of people. What are you talking about? This is the about? second time I've said cadre. Why? Why, uh, why is this word in my, my mouth right now? Anyways, uh, this game goes, it, it's a little spendy, Tyler. If you want like a nice one, even if you're getting it from Zen Market, it's like 150 ish dollars. Could be as high as 250 and has been more expensive in the past. So I don't know why it's coming down right now. Um, but yeah, Super Back to the Future, go check it out. Go watch a video. Like, I'm not saying, it's not so good that you should go, uh, you know, race race to buy it and own it. But watch, watch a video of the gameplay. See if it's something you might be interested in playing. It's available. Even, it's uncommon, it's, you know, but if you want it, it's, uh, it's more common than Lethal Foes. Is it the best Back to the Future game? I don't know. I don't know the history of Back to the Future Ooh. games. If when I think of Back to the Future, I think of Lego Dimensions, which had a bunch of Back to the Future content, and then the NES game, which even as someone who like kind of digs like shitty games, like the Back to the Future game on NES is genuinely trash. It is. made by people who'd never played or never watched Back to the Future. It's inc- it's like people who got like read a story about Back to the Future. And then we took loose elements of what they heard, got drunk, and then decided to make a video game. Yeah, it's terrible. Um, th- well, there's one on the 360, right? But didn't they do? Oh, like Telltale a, a did a whole the series, crew. right? I played those. Yeah. Telltale did like uh, the adventure games. I think those are probably the best ones. But I think this game, because of the style game it is and the era and the pixel art, I think there are going to be some people who like this one best. Sure. Uh, if those de- they Telltale Adventure games, picking. like the art, is always like super ugly in those games. Even yeah. like Sam and, and this, Max, and I love those Sam and Max games, but but those this one also has like kind shaky. of deformed art. Yeah. So just just a warning. But go check it out. It's it's a fun one to watch. Anyways, um, that that's uh that's my Super Famicom pick, and it's just on the Super Famicom. There's not it's not like an MX X version. You know what, Tyler? There's also computer games from like 1984 Back to the Future or 1985 or something. Do you that know? Came out of America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I don't know anything about them. Hmm. All right. Interesting. Um, I the, looking up an entire computer game sounds like too much. It is. Let's see. Oh uh, no. I clicked something with pixel art. I'm like, oh, is this like a LucasArts adventure? But no, it was just a YouTube. The YouTuber face had pixel art and they were playing the Telltale game. So I don't know. Oh. I don't know. Anything no, no, about don't, don't, don't worry. Don't. I was just curious if you did. All right. What's your next game? So when we make these episodes, I have to balance just putting like the most obscure bullshit that like someone who's been doing this for 20 years, like maybe hasn't heard of Lethal Foes. But we do got to go back to the classics in terms of Western properties that are popular collectibles that never made it to America, Johnny, with the Dungeons and Dragons collection for the Sega Saturn, which is uh, for it's a collection of the two arcade games, Shadow over Mistara and Tower of Doom, which are beat 'em ups. And like, but if, you love beat 'em ups, Tyler. I hate beat 'em ups. I know. I mean, these games look cool. Like the graphics are cool. I mean, it's got like these like nicely animated giant sprites, and like I love high fantasy. Like basically, I don't like Golden Axe. By the way, shout out like last episode of the Lost Joystick Network podcast was Golden Axe, a bad video game. But Golden Axe is like the premier fantasy beat 'em up, and Golden Axe sucks. And you put this game next to Golden Axe, and just like everything about it is better than Golden Axe. Um, but you put a gun to someone's head and say like, name five cool Saturn imports. D and D collection is always one that comes up because people love beat em ups. People love dungeons and dragons and it you could play it without knowing any Japanese. It's just one that always comes up. Uh, and like kind of the iconic version is the version that comes with the Ram cartridge. So one of the well, two people games. also love like a, a weird packaging, a weird big box. Yeah, it comes in a big box that has the double thick CD case and then it has the RAM cartridge in addition to that. So it's like a really thick box. Hot. Is that the only way it was sold? No, it was uh, you could either get the big box with the RAM cartridge or it was also sold separately for like 2000 yen less. But I mean, like, don't buy that version. What are you crazy? And like even looking at the ones for sale, just like across Yahoo and stuff. It seems like mostly the big box even. So like, just get the big box. And that's the one everyone wants anyway. I feel this is almost a little bit of a cop out because 
Dungeons and Dragons collection uh, was planned for a North American release. I think yeah. if you look in um, Street Fighter Alpha in like the manual or like an advertising insert or like some pamphlet, it, it mentions the Dungeons and Dragons collection. Um, so this was going to be one of those like 1998, 19, uh, 1997, 1998 uh, late release Saturn games. So if this did come out, it would instantly be like one of these $450 Sega Saturn games that everyone wants. But instead, you get the Japanese version, which has quote unquote always been expensive. It's like 150 yeah. bucks for the big box with the RAM cartridge. But it's kind of like one of those games where it's like, it's still 150 bucks. Like, this is one of those almost iconic Saturn imports that will come up in every Saturn import list, like a Radiant Silver Gun, like Hyper Duel, like all these shooters. Uh, but yeah, you know, still $150, and I'm feeling like in a world where everything has doubled, that doesn't feel too bad for a game that kind of everybody knows about. I was going to say, to be fair... $150 used to be a much bigger sum of money 15 years ago when this was popular with old men like me. So researching this game, like you find a bunch of like back before the internet was all fucking platforms. Like I found a bunch of just like websites about dedicated to the Sega Saturn and there were like comments from the mid 2000s and people were like, this game looks so cool, but it's so expensive. I don't want to spend over a hundred dollars on a video game in like 2007. And here we are 15 years later and it's like not changed that much. Meaning like after inflation and video game prices increasing, it's actually cheaper than it used to be. True. True. So yeah, I'm sure. one of the, I was one of those people like, I don't want to spend a hundred dollars on a game. And yeah, now, now that's us with a thousand dollars, Johnny. Fast, yeah. Flash forward to uh, 15 years from now, we're just going to be like, oh, a thousand dollars in a video game. We spend that all the time. Uh, of course, I spent a thousand dollars on my Super Mario Brothers 3. I heard on the last episode of Collector's Quest that Super Mario Brothers 3 average complete in boxes were going to be worth a thousand dollars. That's sarcasm. Someone out there is going to take that as yeah, don't, yeah. investing don't advice. Do that. that is sarcasm. This is not a financial. <laughs> This is not financial advice. <laughs> that warning that all those financial advice channels give. Um, so the Dungeons and Dragons collection, the kind of the the thing that sticks out to me most about the arcade games, besides the graphics are really cool and Dungeons and Dragons is really cool. They are four player beat em ups, or at least one of them is four player. I, I don't know the difference between them. I'm sorry. Both or one of them are a four player beat em up, meaning they use four buttons on the arcade cabinet. So when I see a main cabinet that has four players and there's more than three buttons on players three and four, the first thing that comes to my mind, I'm like, oh, do you play Dungeons and Dragons? And if they say no, my immediate thought is like, so why do players three and four have more than three buttons? Because it's literally like the only game where players three and four have that many buttons. And don't even get me started on people who put six buttons on players three and four. I'm sure there is like one, but like name me a game where you have four players using six buttons. What are we playing like Super Smash Brothers, the arcade version? What is going on with some of these meme cabinets? Who has three other friends who live in their same city? I know. Like, do people still build meme cabinets? I don't even know how popular meme cabinets are. I feel like I see arcade one ups more often. Ugh, and like God. arcade one ups are like expensive. Like some of them are like like four to eight hundred dollars. Like I don't know. I know, I know it's piracy, but like for eight hundred dollars, like build a fucking main cabinet. That's I was just gonna say that every time I see an arcade one up, I'm like, just buy a main cabinet, dude. This is the worst. Or for eight hundred dollars, like buy a real arcade game. Or you know, even if you can't get like you probably can't get a Donkey Kong for eight hundred dollars anymore. But you know what you can get? You can get a Donkey Kong for like a little more. You're spending eight hundred dollars already. Just save up a few hundred dollars more and get the real thing, whatever it is that you want. Um. I mean, maybe the arcade scene is madness right now and everything's $2,000. I don't know, but. I don't know. We haven't been there. Hey, Tyler, about this Dungeons and Dragons game, though. Did you know that they put out a digital release in North America? Uh, oh, I do know that, but I don't remember where, because I remember thinking about it when it came out. So they, they put it on the Xbox, PS3, and the Wii U. Or, yeah. So that was that was a thing. So you could download it and play it there. But... In Japan on the PS3, they actually got a physical copy, another physical copy of these two games that did not come to America. Whoa. So twice this game had the opportunity to come to America in physical form and failed to do so. 
I, I'm positive you don't know this, but is the PS3 compilation actual arcade ports? It's probably not the Sega Saturn port of the game, right? It's probably just the arcade ports because, I mean, it's like a CPS game. They're like, we have been emulating CPS games. Yeah, uh, I don't. That I don't know. Um, kind, kind of the reason I ask is because, like, yeah, this has been like this $150, like, highly praised thing for a long time. At the end of the day, it's an arcade compilation, which is like, how many collectible arcade compilations are there really? Like, this is one of the most collectible arcade compilations, definitely. And it's like, oh, if you sure. want to sit down and play the Dungeons and Dragons games, these are probably versions that like have slightly worse graphics and you get to play with two players instead of four rather than, you know, just playing them on MAME like any sane human being. So like, because it's like an arcade compilation, like judged on its own merits, I don't really know how cool it is other than the big box and kind of its status as like a default Saturn import. So I kind of like it more as a collectible than care about it as a video game at all. Fair. Um, some other quick notes, just, these are some funny notes, uh, about the, the re-release as, as it were. So the new cover art is definitely like more anime style art. The original box art is like high fantasy European art of dragons and fantasy completely. The new one, you know, whatever, it's fine. Like, uh, it doesn't look bad or anything. But what do you think the price on some? It's just a compilation of a compilation that's already been out, Tyler. How much do you think this goes for? Like MSRP or? No, no. Like if if you wanted to go buy one on eBay right now. Considering like the Saturn one in Japan is like $150. So the PS3 one, $30 it would be my guess. It's like $100. What? <laughs> Why? Which, which is what it was before. Like uh, this is equivalent to the 2007 price. So are people in the same position with this PS3 one where they're like, oh, I really want to play that, but it's just I don't want to spend over a hundred dollars on a game. That's so weird. <laughs> yeah, I just I think that's fun. Anyways, uh, also Tyler and this uh, this is straight Daddy Mulk on this one. Uh, Adventures, uh, advanced D and D. Dragons of Flame was released on the Famicom back in 92. Uh, he says this one's borderline because it was originally based on Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, but it's also a port of an existing PC game. But there, there's a Famicom one that we didn't really get on um, on a console. So and I count if it didn't come out on a console here, then I'm not counting it. What the heck? I, I don't. I don't subscribe to that belief, Johnny. I don't care if you subscribe to it. I'm telling you what I'm doing. <laughs> All right. This isn't this isn't what would Tyler do? Get out of here. Johnny, those are some games. Yeah. Um I I've got some more I want to run down. Like Let's do uh, it. we don't we're not going to talk about them. I just want to like real quickly, things that I think are funny that were games that did not come out. We we already mentioned Star Wars weird. Can you imagine making Darth Vader a scorpion now? To in today's like, I'm gonna make a Star Wars game, and yeah, you know that guy Darth Vader. I'm gonna transform him into a scorpion as the last boss. You guys cool with that? To be clear, we are talking about uh, Namcot Star Wars yeah. for the Famicom, yes. which is an exclusive yeah. Star Wars game. Yes, in different from the JVC game. Yes, on the Nintendo. But yeah, th this is a thing that happened. I just can't imagine now. Also, a lot of these, I mean, since we're talking about licensed properties, licensed property games were such trash back in the day. No one cared about them. They were like the cheap properties to get, which is why the LGNs of the world uh, have all these licensed properties. Like, they were just going to make trash games because these weren't the things that sold games. Pac-Man, Donkey Kong, those sold video games. Some Disney property? Garbage. Not going to deal with this. Um, hey, you like Mickey Mouse games? There are... Considered to be four Mickey Mouse games, just straight up like called Mickey Mouse. The naming conventions of these games and what they do to them is crazy. So it might be a Ghostbusters game, it might be a Garfield game, it might be a Bugs Bunny game. It just keeps changing. So, like, if you're interested in Mickey Mouse games, go look at like Bugs Bunny's Crazy Castles. Go look at all the twists and turns the Mickey Mouse games have taken. Um, just really weird. And this, this is where I want to get your take, Tyler. Uh, I asked you before the show started, but what makes a game a different game? Is the title change enough? Does it is changing the sprites enough? What makes it different? So 
let's talk about my favorite example of this. Not your favorite example, but mine. Contra versus like Probotector. Same game? Yeah, I think those are the same game. Those are the same game. So and, th- I think this is the heart. You're, what you're talking about, because you're going to bring up something like, you know, Doki Doki Panic and, I, and that's Super exactly Marvel where team. I'm going. And I, I know you're going to bring up like whatever the crazy castle, whatever the crazy castle series is a nightmare. But um, this, I think, is the hardest category to separate out what actually is a different game, because I'm generally of the belief that anything that like even seems like it would be the same thing, just count it as the same thing. We know in our hearts that those are the same game. But when there are not only title changes, not only gameplay changes, not only like completely thematic overhauls, uh, like a completely different licensed franchise, that's when like it becomes blurry whether it's a different game to me. Because yeah, I, uh, something like, uh, what's your example? Actually, give me your example. Well, I, I was I was gonna go with that, but uh, yeah, Mario versus Doki Doki Panic. You can Mario Two versus Doki Doki Panic, and then Mario Two USA. So, like, is, like, the difference between Doki Doki Panic and Super Mario Brothers 2 in America is probably, like, maybe bigger than the difference between Madden NFL 2K8 and Madden NFL 2K9. So, and, but, okay. like, those are different games. So. Fair enough. That's where it, it's, like, maybe they should just be different games. But I don't know where the cutoff line is. That's why I just need, I just need someone to decide it for me. I've. I've ripped my hair out for like a decade trying to figure out like what counts, what's a set, what's a video game, and I basically gave up. So, so yeah, and look, I, I don't think there's a good answer here. I, I just, you know, I like to bring things up for people to think about. So here, here's one. Hey, Mickey Mouse 3. How do you feel about Mickey Mouse 3? Do you want it? This is uh, Yume Fus- Fusen. Uh, it's the Dream Balloon. Um, do you want to know what this game came out in America as? Yes, no, no. Any takers? Balloon fight. You in the front. No. Kid Clown in Nightmare World. What? Wait. (laughs) Wait, that's a Mickey Mouse game? Or what was it? Which one came first? It was a Mickey Mouse game. It, it, It started as Mickey Mouse and then was released in the US as Kid Clown. The NES game or the Super Nintendo one? The NES game. Well, what? No, 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 wait. Uh, Kid Clown in Nightmare World. That's the NES one. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. That's Famicom to, to Nintendo, yeah. I remember that's the NES one because after I played it, you explained the pun of Nightmare, nightmare. and Nightmare yeah. to me. <laughs> yeah, it's Nightmare, get it? And you were like, oh, and I was like, oh my God, really? <laughs> that was a fun moment. Um, So Roger Rabbit, another, this game uh, is not the same as the LGN game. It is reskinned and re-released in the US as Bugs Bunny's Crazy Castle. So. All right. Just <laughs> neat. It's weird because Disney Johnny games because Mickey are, Mouse is American. That's Yeah, Disney that's the wrong way around. Disney games are crazier. <laughs> are crazy the way the go look at the Crazy Castle series. It it, it hurts my head thinking about it. Um, Johnny, you know who's done that for you actually? The angry video game nerd. Oh god damn it. <laughs> You know I don't watch him. I'm not I interested. know. That's why it's so funny when you bring up uh, things that he has videos on. I, he's been making videos a very long time. It's it, true. And his overlords are making him make more, more and more. Uh, anyways, just some more fun ones that just exist. And we, we don't have to go too into this at all. But Major League, the movie Major League, the baseball movie with Charlie Sheen, has a game on the Famicom. Like, what? Why? And I say that. That's also you know, that's I, such a terrible... Uh, f- property to make a thing on because the name doesn't even sound like a licensed property. It sounds like the most generic thing ever. Yep. Um, here, we didn't get to mention any of the PC Engine ones. I know we've talked about how Batman there is a different game than the Batman we got, but in that same vein of Airwolf uh, and games like that in the A-Team, Knight Rider Special. That's a, that's a PC Engine game that you can go spend $60 on if you want. And also Die Hard. These are PC Engine games that are different than the Nintendo versions. Cool, right? Pretty cool. Pretty cool, right? Right? There's also some Wizard of Oz games. Uh, there was an Ants World Sports that didn't come out uh, on the Game Boy Color. Didn't come out here. Like, what? Ants it got a PAL release, but didn't get released here? 
I was what so scared happening? we were going to have to talk about the Ants Game Boy Color game that only came out right. in Europe as if anyone was going to care about that, Johnny. Yeah, but this is the last one I do want to tell you about. And okay. I'm going to close it at this. Waterworld. And I bring this up for you, buddy, because I know you like Waterworld like a weirdo. So there's a Waterworld that came out um, for the Nintendo. And uh, it, it, actually, Waterworld has a surprising release list. So we know about the Virtual Boy Waterworld. It also was a Super Nintendo game, a Game Boy game. It was released, a completely different game is released for DOS and Windows. Uh, so it goes from um, like a, a, a shooter type game to real-time strategy. They just completely changed like a shooting platformer to, to real-time strategy. I Crazy. Uh, Multiple genres also, in a video game always makes it cool. Okay, the only place Waterworld got released in in the version it was intended to was the Virtual Boy. It got released in Europe for the Super Nintendo and the Game Boy, but it was supposed to get releases on the U.S. Super Nintendo, the U.S. Game Boy, the Genesis, the Saturn, the Jaguar, and the 3DO. All of these were planned to be published and canceled. Weird. Uh, all of them got like pretty middling reviews as well. Um, Game Boy One actually getting the best reviews. The Water World for the Virtual Boy is, uh, by some regarded, the worst Virtual Boy game. But who cares? Because that was released in America, and we all got to play it. Uh, the Water World art on the Super Fam uh, Super Famicom uh, Super Nintendo PAL box is goddamn terrible. It's in this blue box, and it's like the jet ski scene. It just you're just like, what is? What am I looking at? This is so boring. Terrible box art. Um, not too expensive. But if you care about Waterworld, um, you can you can go find uh, that on a on a Game Boy system for PAL or a Super Nintendo. I, and I only brought this up because I know you like Waterworld. And that's it. And that, that's the episode, guys. We did it. So, some PAL games. Uh, some, some PAL, some Japanese, American-ish properties that never made it to America. Johnny, Water Waterworld is like one of my favorite movies, but I haven't seen I know. it in probably 10 years. And now that I'm saying that out loud, like I'm worried to see it and be like, oh, no, it's not as good as I remember. I, you know, you let me know. We can have a watch party. How I've told you Waterworld. Water World, I, I remember Waterworld being somewhat long, which is probably why I it, like it, it is so long. Much. It, it was like it was long. It was uh, I think it came out in 95, right? Like 95 or 96. I went to go see it as a double feature, not not a. This is not a planned double feature, but it was so hot. My friend and I took the bus, and it was a, it was a summer release, and we just didn't want to be outside uh, because it was too damn hot. It was over a hundred, and we were like, "All right, we'll go to the movies and just sneak into one." So we just looked at movies that started and then ended next to each other, so we could see two, and that wound up being Clueless and Waterworld. And we went when we went in, we were like, "Okay, well, we're gonna watch Waterworld, and that's gonna be awesome." And Clueless is going to be stupid, but at least we can just have soda and not be hot. Truly the Barbie Heimer of 1995, Johnny. Oh, yeah. Uh, anyways, Clueless is awesome and Waterworld is not, even though I know you love it. Sorry. I like the Postman, too. It's the I, same I also movie. saw that. It's the same movie. Um, anyways, that's it. All right. We did it, Tyler. What else nice we got? We got a, yeah. a collector's question, Johnny. Do we? I, you know what? You, while we were talking about our bonus games here, we I could have brought it up, but I didn't. Have. Oh, it's not a collector's sure. question. I always get this wrong. It's an ask the podcast. No, it's uh, the segment is collector's question, but you you made the channel. Oh, what ask okay. the podcast. I wanted to make it clear. Um, Final Fight CD asks. I know watch collecting has little crossover in the world of video game collecting. Yeah, I I would think so, but. In the vintage world, a watch's provenance can greatly impact price. Do you think we'll get to a point where a game's history will impact the game's value? Like if you have two identical games, but one is valued and sought after the other because it was once owned by XYZ. This doesn't necessarily pertain to graded games, but it helps eliminate the authentication and condition variables. Um, I, I think so. I mean, I think we're already seeing that. Like people are like, oh yeah, I want part of this collection and they're... Like I saw something listed as the Dreamer collection. They're they're trying to make that work. I don't particularly care about that right now. It would have to be something very interesting or important 
for me to care more about it. Like it came from Miyamoto's library or something. And then I'm like, oh shit. Yeah, that that version of the game is now more important to me than all the other ones. But, but yeah, this doesn't matter to me, especially if I just want the game to collect. I don't give a shit who owned it before. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the only kind of provenance things I'd care about are, yeah, like you said, even in terms of libraries, there were some developers like uh, like Origin Systems had like their internal library that uh, employees could rent games out of. And like Stefan bought like a little big adventure from that library. Like that's super cool just because of where that game had been. Uh, there are games like, and I this is kind of adjacent to the question, but like the Super Metroid not for resale cartridge uh, on Super Nintendo. It's just a copy of Super Metroid and it has a sticker slapped on the back of it. So it's, it's literally just a loose copy of Super Metroid, but it sells for a big premium because it's cool that it was the kiosk cart. As in terms of like being owned once by XYZ, I don't think there's anyone big enough in the game collecting world for me to care. Uh, another thing I care about is I have a bunch of um, quote unquote, like prototype and review and preview PlayStation one and PS two games, which are literally just burned CDRs. And the only reason I put any stock into them is because they came directly from Jason Wilson, who was just like this huge guy. He bought up all this old, uh, like, I don't know, was like magazine stuff and defunct publishers and he just sold like prototypes and all this cool stuff for all this time. So I know everything that came from Jason is legit, even though I paid like very little for all of that. Um, but if you're buying it from me, like you shouldn't take my word that like, oh yeah, this is, this is from the dream TR collection. It's a, it's a preview disc of Valkyrie profile burned on like a generic, uh, CDR. I can't see it. I think it's going to matter to some people. Some people already put stock in that. And I, I think not for us is not the same as not ever going to be a thing. But like, you you know about these WADA, uh, what are the, uh, the pedigrees? Like the California yeah. collection, the Carolina collection. Like, do you, ca <laughs> can you name anyone whose collection these actually are? Like some of them I know are just like, we found these games in the back of like a, a VH, like a rental shop. And like the Carolina yeah. collection is like D Dane's collection that was owned by Go Collect Jeff afterwards. Like that's, I don't know. It's I guess there's provenance to that. We were both, I I wouldn't say we were both the most active Nintendo Age users, but both of us have a connection to Nintendo Age, and neither of us care about even owning Dane's games. So, who is who's going to care about this stuff? I mean, and we we even joked like I I was joke mock angry that someone else got the California collection. Well, I'm right here, buddy. I'm right here. Who who got the California collection over me? Uh, just yeah, to explain, cares? because sometimes we don't explain things, Johnny. Uh, Dane was the creator and owner of Nintendo Age, and he sold out all his games. They all got created by Wada, and they are now the Carolina collection. Which and yeah, that was random games pop Go up Club. for auction all the time, and uh, who cares? <laughs> Hey, remember when Go Collect was going to save us? Thanks, uh, Go Collect. We were like optimistic for a minute. We're like, man, this we, company has, I mean, I know they bought Nintendo Age, but they haven't screwed anything up. Literally, the only thing Go Collect did in the entire video game collecting hobby is shut down the Nintendo Age database. Like, fuck the forum. Like, most people hated the Nintendo Age forum, didn't care. Like, whatever. Great. We got Video Game Sage out of that. But the only thing they did is this website that everyone went to to look up Nintendo games. They just shut it down. Thanks, yep. Go Collect. Yeah, uh -huh. I would rather I would rather it exist as as the old broken Nintendo Age version it was than what happened. Yeah. Um, anyways, um, and hey, just uh, if you are interested in w watching people repair wristwatches and collect them, I know there's a channel called Wristwatch Revival um, on YouTube. You can go check that out. It's done by Marshall Sutcliffe, and he is a guy who um, he does a big magic podcast, and he's been in the magic scene since like. Same time as I, as he usually is like an announcer at, at big events, but you know, he's a guy who's very passionate about watches. Like I know he legitimately cares about watches and stuff. So it's always more interesting for me to watch people who are geeking out about the thing they're doing rather than just seeing an opportunity to make money and doing it. Yep. Uh, another question from final fight CD Johnny watching some guys struggle on YouTube or listen to a podcast where the host speaker isn't any good. Makes me really appreciate the art and skill of public speaking. You guys are great. Only reading this question because he's complimenting us. Uh, oh. Was this something you had to practice or did it come naturally? Oh, uh, I think we're terrible. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, 
we we get like our reviews. Uh, I don't read our reviews because I'm way too sensitive. But like, there'll be like one bad review out of like a sea of like all our fans and people who love us. We love you. Um, and I'll be like, these guys suck. They're not interesting to listen to. And it'll just like weigh on me for the rest of my life. Like, I suck as a speaker. I'm not interesting to listen to. I don't explain things well enough. I don't talk about interesting topics. I'm not passionate enough about video games. No, I don't. I didn't practice anything. I think especially if you listen to like, or when did I come on Collector's Quest? Around like episode 85? Like no, I definitely. Like 78. I think 78. Yeah. I was not as good back then because uh, I don't know. I was a lot more nervous about talking and like I've known you for so long now, Johnny. It's just a natural conversation with you. And I know to make interesting audio content, I have to sound like I'm interested in what I am talking about. And yeah, and I think the some of the YouTubers, like some of like the small YouTubers who are just like kind of new to making videos, kind of sound like they don't, they just reading from their Google Doc script and they don't care about what they're talking about. You just got to care about what you're talking about and sometimes get angry about a Super Famicom game for some reason. Yeah, just, I don't know. Have an opinion. Be into it. You know, we, there's sometimes that I've had people ask me, do I even care? It's like, of course, I'm very passionate. I'm stupidly passionate about games uh, in an embarrassing fashion, um, which is why you guys are all here. You are probably the same, or why would you spend your time listening? Because I, I like, I think we're fine, Tower. Like, you know, I, I never like to, I'm not a guy who poo-poo's the podcast. You sometimes do that. And I'm always like, hey, we do a good job. We're working hard. And like, you know, one, we don't get everything right all the time. Uh, sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes I feel like I always feel when I have too much spit in my mouth and I'm like, oh, was I a little slurry on that episode? Oh, God. Like, I get in my own head about it. If you guys think we sound good and we're doing a good job, that that means a lot to us, I know. And I appreciate it. Uh, the part, did I have any practice? Yeah, I did. So uh, I, I've talked about it before, but my big dream back in the day, and it's like why, why sometimes I will bust out a stupid voice. I went to college and I, when I first started, I was going for theater. And I didn't care about theater. I did theater, but I didn't really care about theater. What I wanted to do if I couldn't make games is I wanted to be a voice actor. That's it. I just wanted to be a voice actor and be a voice in a cartoon. That was it. That's all I ever wanted. So I was like, okay, that would be my niche, uh, niche, and that, that's what I'm going to work on. So I would just practice stupid voices. I, I was never recording it, uh, and I wish I would have because hearing yourself talk and like just hearing it and getting over how you sound, the because your voice resonates completely different in your head than it does out of your mouth. So hearing it played back, especially depending on what kind of recording device, it's going to tweak it a little bit. But it's it's very hard to listen to yourself sometimes. Like I. I do not envy Tyler when he edits and he has to hear himself and me talk again. I know when I was editing very poorly, just hearing myself speak, it's it's like daggers, but you, you need to do it. So I, I used to practice in that way. I do have a degree in communications. Uh, I also have a degree in in uh, media. So yeah, there, there's stuff there that led me here. But um, yeah, there and... I had like a brief podcast before this with like seven episodes about a card game that I like, but that was really nothing. We were horrible then. And uh, I was horrible when I started. I think all the old episodes with me and Kat are just, uh, aside from the audio quality, I just think they're like 100% unlistable. I tried to listen to one yesterday and I w it was like screaming in my head <laughs> as I, and I was just trying to write down the games that we mentioned in that episode. And I'm like, I'll never get through all of these to write down all the games we mentioned because it I can't do it. I can't hear myself and these episodes are terrible. So the fact that anyone thinks we're doing a good job is great. Yeah. I think I'm way better at scripted content than live content, you but I just don't have time to do any scripted yeah. content. So uh John Brown, People if you're listening, to... I've I've got like three quarters of the script for this stupid Dungeon of Doom review. I know I have to do it's been maybe a year since he sent me that game. I already sent it back, but I still haven't made the review. I, and doing more YouTube videos. I kind of want to do a Cruelty Squad YouTube video, Johnny. Um, we'll talk yeah. about that, maybe. Yeah, do it. Um, yeah, and you may have seen me throw out some. Man, you want to know getting over a hurdle? Like uh, you're talking about scripted performance. Hearing yourself is one thing. Then having to see yourself and hear yourself, just gee, double fuck you. Why? Why? I don't want to see myself. I don't want to hear myself. Um, like some guy just made a comment on the on the video, just like, uh, oh, when the voice doesn't match the face, and I was like, hey, fuck you, damn it, <laughs> why <laughs> does, does my voice not match my face? Fuck, got me, god damn it. 
Uh, it made me, it made, like, I'm not upset about it, but it made me stop and think for like maybe 10 seconds to be like, what the fuck does that mean? Then I'm like, who cares? Who cares, random guy on the internet? Move on. So anyways, uh, the fact that you do YouTube videos at all and you have to look at yourself is... Oh, uh, no, I mean, all edit, my YouTube ugh. videos that I like anyway are just like graphics on a screen. I don't like videoing myself. I'm always like sweaty and like the lighting is hard. I'm sweaty right now. And like I've got my air conditioning going full blast, and but it's because I'm wearing headphones and I'm in like a stuffy room with a bunch of electronics on. Like I don't want people looking at me sweating. And then when you're doing like scripted video, you have to memorize all your lines. Like when when we're doing just audio, like it's so easy to say one sentence and cut, say one sentence and cut. But then in scripted video, you got to say like longer to make it seem more natural. And then you're like you're sweating more, and it's like as it goes on, you get more sweaty. And it videos are gross. Don't do videos. I'm it, sure the people hard. who do videos literally every day, they get really confident and comfortable with it. But Well, they get comfortable, and they also start to learn that, oh, we need this equipment, we need, we need this lighting. Your equipment is a big deal. What you have at your disposal, if you just like pick up your camera and put it on your face with like natural lighting, it's going to look a lot different than if you've got proper equipment. So just keep that in mind. All right, Johnny, we talked enough about uh, how great we are and all the advice we, we have to we, give Did we talk about how great we were? I think we just said we're like medium uh well we we read a question that talked about how great we are johnny what are you buying what are you playing okay tyler yes i'm gonna tell you about that right after this okay this is where we insert a commercial and then it plays right Uh, to get our ad revenue patreon.com slash collector's quest yeah two dollars four dollars or six dollars yeah, I, I didn't you notice I stopped mentioning the six dollar one completely? Oh, did you? All right, yeah, two or four dollars. I don't know. I haven't mentioned it in months. I don't. I don't even mention the six dollar tier. Yeah. The only reason it's not one dollar is because Patreon takes too big of a cut. You're basically just paying Patreon at that point. So two dollars. If you can't pay two dollars, just you know, don't pay. Whatever. This is free. So Tyler, you want to know what I'm buying and what I'm playing? Let me answer the easy question first. I'm playing Diablo. That's it. Still playing that. It's, it sounds like it's got you on the treadmill, and I heard there was a bunch of outrage over them literally just nerfing a bunch of things and making the treadmill bigger. Uh, yeah, so their their theory of, of balance was, let's make everything worse. That'll balance it. And, you know, it's like, they, they didn't balance for fun, Tyler, which is a crazy thing. Uh, there's like, well, these powers are over character. It's like, well, are people having fun? Well, yes. Well, don't don't do the thing that stops the fun, guys. Um, whatever. People got over it, and then season one came, and now the people are just invested in new characters in season one. So um, I saw some of the. I mean, I realize I'm seeing like the meme pictures on the internet of like the worst things, but I saw some of the cosmetics, and it's just like a sword. Here is a sword. It looks like you got it from a Unity asset pack. It's a Diablo yes. game. You're not going to see your sword anyway, but aren't you glad that you bought this cosmetic generic sword? Oh, absolutely not. Uh, are you bu- are you buying the the season packs, Johnny? I didn't because you can just play the seasonal content for free, and I don't care what I look like in Diablo. Like okay. I I care, yes. but I'm not buying cosmetics to advance out. I don't give a shit if I got a cool trophy on the back of my horse's ass. It just doesn't matter to me. I don't know about you. So like a big part of Diablo four, I don't know if this is a big part, but you collect items. And then one of the things you could do is bring the items to the blacksmith to unlock the cosmetic of that item. So you can destroy an item to like unlock the cosmetic in your library. So isn't like the whole fun of the game. If you want to kit out your dude and make him look cool, like to actually fucking find that stuff. So it means something. The fact that all the coolest shit, they're just going to put behind paywalls. Like, that sucks. I mean, it's you still cosmetics do. Cosmetics are literally a gameplay mechanic and I think a cool gameplay mechanic that like really encourage you to find a bunch of items that you normally wouldn't care about, but it's totally thrown away because all the coolest shit's just, you just buy it. See, I don't think all the coolest shit, like I, I think there's definitely cooler stuff to find. You still find stuff. But okay. Like some of the stuff looks really ugly. I'm just like, mm, I'm glad I'm just finding the stuff. Like I like the way my character looks. I'm, I'm happy with it. So that's what I'm playing, Tower. I, I am on the treadmill. But I, I play with my friend. I play with my best friend and, you know. Remember how you thought you were going to play with me? That's funny. I Look, Tower, I want to play with you, okay? And you just wouldn't play with me. I wanted you to play with me and my best friend too. Then, when my wife's done I, with RimWorld, we'll start playing Diablo again. Oh, whoa! I also, I just think you would really get along with my my best friend because you guys are very similar. 
Um, and I have the same kind of dumb. So wait, how similar are we? While we're playing Diablo Four, presumably like in a voice chat, is he just going to be complaining about how he'd rather be playing Path of Exile the whole time? Because no. then we'd get along famously. No, no, no. Um, in fact, he. Uh, it, it's not that you guys are exactly the same. In, like I, in this area, I think you guys are going to be very different. But I'm just talking about the kind of dumb arguments I get into. Um, you guys school, you, the way you guys think isn't exactly the same, but the way you guys conjure arguments is very similar and, uh, and act arguments with me. So, okay. Well, I, and I obviously cool? like that. Tyler, I got a bunch of stuff. Like, don't rush me. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Don't rush me. Hey. So we can keep talking about your friend. No. I just, What's his name? I need to meet his him. Name is, his name is Nate. Shout out to you, Nate. A podcast you're not listening to. Hey, uh, what did I buy? Uh, I bought that Muhammad Ali with card. Yes, you you really like were determined like that's the coolest thing that we're not talking about. This Muhammad Ali, it's got a card. There's so many games trading cards, but he's he's the greatest. So yeah, uh, yeah. My God, how much? Muhammad how much Ali. is that? Here, let's let's get into five. I got Johnny. I got I paid nineteen dollars for it. Nineteen dollars ship total after tax. Actually, with the game that. or just the card? With the game and everything. Wow, it was complete. Uh, yeah, total came out to nineteen dollars and twenty cents. That was five dollars and seventy cents shipping, twelve fifty nine total, and ninety one cent tax. And I think I got a deal on it. I think that's a deal, Johnny. I'm guessing that uh, was not listed as like Muhammad Ali with the card in the. It event. was actually really, huh? Yeah, Muhammad Ali heavyweight boxing Sega Genesis cartridge box game card. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure this game doesn't sell for a lot. But like, even if I knew enough about the thing I'm selling to be like, okay, this is a retro video game and someone has kept this collectible trading card, which would so easily fall out of the case for 30 years. And then they're just like, and I've got to price it and I'm going to price it at $12. It's like, at, at what point is it just like not worth it to like... Just put if if that was the only one for sale or something, just put like a ridiculous buy now. Put it up for fifty dollars. See if someone will like is desperate enough to pay for it. I don't know. You know you have the thing, and you're still just like basically giving it away after shipping and eBay fees and the time you spend packing it and the time you spend taking pictures and the time stop, you spend listing. Stop it. trying to raise the prices on the I'm dumb games I want to buy. I don't. I don't think like you should raise the price of everything, but like at some point, like all these like little eight dollar sales you're making just aren't worth the effort. Probably like, true. I think Probably. it makes more sense for something like cards, which are so standard and uniform and easy to ship. But like a Sega Genesis game, even like if you're a bullshit seller, like you usually don't have bubble mailers to put that in. Whereas you have DVD sized bubble mailers if you want to destroy a PS2 game in shipping. But uh, like they did they ship it to you in a box? They, they did. What a hassle. There's another yeah. hassle. Just finding boxes for all the shit you need to sell. And you're going to sell mean, it for $12? I mean, what, what he's the I greatest. I, I did. I, I said that in a video. As a matter of fact, I know. Um, anyways, w what else did I buy? You want to you want to hear all the awesome things I bought, Tyler? Absolutely. I bought Bramble on the Nintendo Bramble, the Mountain King for the switch. That sounds like a fake video game. Like, okay. <laughs> if you uh, if we are still doing that chat, GPT, is this a real switch game? I'd be like, nah, Bramble, the Mountain King is not a real switch game. Yeah, uh, I bought. Killer Frequency. Okay, wait, what are these? Why are you buying these? I don't know what that is. Halloween is stuff. Oh, it's Halloween stuff. Okay. Dredge Deluxe Edition. More Halloween stuff. Huh? Huh? You like it? Yeah. No? Wait, no? Dredge, the, the fishing game? That's actually yep. kind of cool. Yeah, it's the Deluxe yeah, I'm into. Is that on Switch? It is. Did that actually have a retail release, or is that like one of these like iMape It type deals? No, it's an actual retail release. I bought it at Best Buy. Damn. It's like... Thirty-five dollars. Wow. That's so cool that that game. That's like like a Cthulhu, like, like a Lovecraftian fishing game. That's so cool that it has like a big retail release. I thought that would be like kind of a niche thing. Yep, yeah, this is the deluxe edition. Thought it was cool. Neat. I'm way into that. I don't care uh, about Bramble the Mountain King, but I also don't know what it is. I guess. Well, all the these games all have one thing in common, and that's that they were all nominated in the Horror Awards. The first annual Horror Awards are going to be happening soon for games and i was like uh what is this unfortunately a lot of the games like i love more attention on horror and halloween type games but unfortunately um a lot of these games are just digital only 
So I was like, meh, I need these games. To, like the coolest looking games didn't get physical releases. I need to see some physical releases. Anyways, I also bought the Callisto Protocol for the PS4. Uh, cool. Cool. That, that that's it. That's it. That's what I bought. And that's what's here. What about uh, you? Did you buy anything? Get anything? John, Play anything? I. I was having a conversation with our friend Nick. Speaking of like people who are too passionate about video games, Nick would be number one on my list of collectors who are too passionate about video games, which to be clear, like all of us are. We're all out of our minds. Um, and we were just having one of our normal off the rails conversations. And Nick was talking about how cool foreign games are. And he's buying all these like tech toy Brazil things and talking about how cool it is. Cause like no one has this stuff except for him. Cause no one's going out of their way to collect like these rare, weird regional releases. And I'm me. So I'm talking about like, yeah, like I kind of feel the same way about games from the 1970s. Like there's really only so many games from the 1970s. Uh, so I kind of think like if a game came out in the seventies, like by default, it's already cool. And somehow that transitioned into how he wants a Magnavox Odyssey. And I've got a really nice Magnavox Odyssey. And somehow it he, he asked me, do you have the full set of Magnavox Odyssey games? And I'm like, no, Nick, there's a but like a couple of those are like really obscure and expensive. And like, who cares about Magnavox Odyssey games? But, but like by the nature of our conversation, it's like, God, damn, I, like if anyone is going to collect Magnavox Odyssey games, Johnny, it's me. Why am I not collecting Magnavox Odyssey games? That was the real question. So no, no, Tyler, don't the Odyssey wait. came. It came with like 12 games. There's only like six cartridges, I think. Like there's quote unquote 12 games that come with a Magnavox Odyssey. And even the separately released games, there's only 10 of them. And one of them was like a free mail away. It's not like super uncommon. Just like I think if you bought an Odyssey during some period, they just like had like a sticker on the box. You mail it away and you get a game called like Precepts or Percepts or something. So there's really only nine Odyssey games, but they were sold via mail order and at Magnavox distributors already like super cool. Like who the fuck has Magnavox Odyssey games? They're kind of rare. They're not super rare, but they're kind of rare. And, like, as we were having this conversation, there was a six-pack of games in, like, the distributor box on eBay. So I went and I bought six Magnavox Odyssey games in their little distributor box. Uh, so, Johnny, now I have a... Uh, I've got a big collection of Magnavox Odyssey games. Only, like, four left to complete the set. Stop it, Tyler. Oh, yeah. Like, and it it was expensive. This was, like, a like a $500 purchase. But, like, yeah. then when, like, you break it down and you're like, well, it's really only, like, $75 per complete in-box game plus the the outer box, like, the distributor box, the shipping box that it came in for, like, Magnavox Odyssey games. Like, that's, like, where am I going to find these? So I bought six Magnavox Odyssey games. Like, they've got, like, the... Uh, the TV overlays, they all have like little fiddly bits because they're Magnavox Odyssey games and some of them have new cartridges. It's really funny uh, because TV sizes in the 70s were so different. They come with like two different sizes of uh, of overlays to put over your TV. Oh, the Magnavox Odyssey is so cool. Nick is so right. Like this is the stuff I should be buying. This is some real Tyler stuff. I'm uh, in. Yuck. Yuck. Do not uh, want. Yeah. And then... uh. And then I played, uh, you know, one of the best games I've ever played in my fucking life, Johnny. Uh, Tell us more. Game that I've been telling everyone about, even though, like, I think everyone already knows about it. Uh, Johnny, uh, the Cruelty Squad, also just known as Cruelty Squad. Also, by the way, I played Amori, which is like one of these Earthbound RPGs. It's like a like this really good five to six hour like depression visual novel, like this horror visual novel, and then they tacked on this meaningless 20 hour earthbound rpg onto it uh if you don't know amori is the game with like the little hand-drawn kid with the black light bulb over him i don't recommend it i think it's too long but speaking of games that basically are passion projects by one person johnny cruelty squad like literally a top 10 game i've ever played it is johnny i hate I hate video games. There's too much goddamn shit in video games. Even games I like. I would like, like, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2. Like, the new one, the re-release, like, whatever. I like going through the Call of Duty campaigns. Like, they're fun. They're they're a distraction. I'm sure the gunplay is going to feel good. It's going to be a fun game. I've seen all this shit before. Oh, there's going to be... 
uh, a bombing run uh mission at night where like you're in night vision and you're just like bombing dudes on the ground it's like yeah it's fun but like yeah i've seen it before kind of seen everything before all oh, this game's going on for like 10 hours like am i really seeing 10 hours of new experiences in this call of duty game johnny i have i have problems with modern games uh cruelty squad it's like hitman with deus ex level design the high speed movement of quake and star siege tribes it's got Rainbow Six breaching through windows by, like, swinging down and kicking windows. It's got Spider-Man swinging. There's Delta Force vibes. Everyone remembers 1998 tactical FPS Delta Force. The story and themes, it's like this, it's almost RoboCop-esque in how it's, like, complete over-the-top violence for the point of making, like, a political message. It's like a super satirical critique on capitalism. And it looks like the PlayStation game LSD and every level is like literally two minutes long. It's the perfect video game. I hate everything about video games. I think they're too they're too long. I've seen too much of it before. Levels go on too long. They don't introduce new concepts enough. And this this is the perfect video game, Johnny. It's I, I can't. Eat, it's like all my favorite '90s shooters combined into one game, and it is the best art game of all time. Because it was made by, like, a Finnish artist who, t he just, like, he wanted to make a first-person shooter. So he looked up a tutorial on how to make a first-person shooter. He, just some fucking artist guy. He looks like just some high school douchebag when you look at his Instagram. <laughs> and he made one of my favorite, not even one of my favorite first-person shooters of all time. One of my favorite games of all time. Um, it, you know, everyone who hasn't played this game is like, all right, it's it's a weird shooter that looks like LSD. But uh, yeah, if anyone's played Cruelty Squad, hit me up because I want to do nothing but talk about and play more of this fucking game, Johnny. You should play it. He, he's not hes not even kidding. He really, just anything he can do to get people to talk to him about, about this game. Yeah. I, I don't know anyone who has played this game. Oh, so like the whole thing, like it, it looks like garbage. Like, you know, LSD on PlayStation, it's just like this yeah. weird world with all these like weird clashing, bright colored, repeating textures. It has a very similar vibe to it. But then it's also like this kind of quakish FPS game on top of it, which is just it makes me hate these games like Journey and Proteus because all Journey has is the art style. Like the puzzles in Journey, the platforming in Journey is not good. So this is just like proof that there can be like this complete work of art video game that's also as good as fucking Quake. Oh, it's so good, Johnny. And there's no physical version. I can't even collect it. I'm it's the perfect can't collect. I'm sorry you can't collect that, buddy. I know. All right. Did we do it? I think we did it. What's it, how, What's our time at? Oh, two hours. That's an episode, right? We did it. Yeah, that's an episode. We did it. Short episode. We did it. All right. <laughs> Short woo. episode. Well, and we're going to cut out like 10 minutes. Oh, don't tell the people that. They're going to wonder, oh. like, what's all that good stuff you cut out? Uh, the good stuff we cut out was my son walking in. What kind of conversations did you have? Oh, you were talking about the new Indiana Jones movie? Were there any good takes on that? Were there any hot takes on that? Yeah, Did I JD like fine. when Indiana Jones punched a Nazi in the face and started laughing? Yeah. Uh, hilariously, my son's favorite part of the movie is when Indiana Jones punches a Nazi in the face. It's the most Indiana Jones moment in the whole fucking movie. And my son, he bought in instantly. My son, a four-year-old, knew that that was the quintessential Indiana Jones moment. <laughs> Just hilarious to me. Anyways, that's it. We did it. We did the show. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. Uh, thank you, especially to our Patreons who support us and allow us to keep doing this. Is that true? Do they allow us to keep doing this? Not really. I mean, we probably do it anyway. Oh, okay. I mean, I just hear everyone say that, and I'm like, is that actually true? Do Be hmm. sure to leave us a like on iTunes. It will really help the show out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, go to iTunes and make that algorithm love us. Leave a comment. What? On on SoundCloud, I don't. You can't really leave a comment anywhere. Maybe on SoundCloud. I don't know. That's it for the show. We had some fun. Hope you did too. Bye. Yep. And you can find me on Video Game Sage or the Discord. I'm default gen, default gen. No one can find you anywhere. You fucking <laughs> hermit. <laughs>